2 Corinthians chapter 7, we talked about depression. We've talked about anger. Tonight we're analyzing anxiety. One verse of scripture that is really a window into the soul of the Apostle Paul. And as we look at it together, it's a real window into your life and mine and how we can deal with this unpleasant emotion we know as anxiety. We're thinking about analyzing anxiety. We analyzed anger last time. Tonight we look at anxiety. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we're looking at verse 5. This is, of course, Paul talking in his second letter to the church at Corinth. I've mentioned before, scholars are really divided on exactly how many letters he wrote to this church. We know from the book of Acts, he was there in person for a year and a half. He certainly wrote two. He may have written three. Some scholars believe he may have even written four letters altogether. The Holy Spirit has seen to it that we have these two to become part of God's word. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 5. For when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, without fightings, within fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. These two verses, and I could have used any number of them in the New Testament, not counting the old, kind of really floated up from inside as I was thinking about what of many texts we could look at to study this subject of anxiety. And the more I looked into this one, I really felt like it was the best that we could look at tonight because it's got so many aspects to it that can affect and uh, resonate with all of our lives. The first thing we're looking at, of course, is Paul in particular, and as he phrases it, what was going on inside and what was going on outside? Because they're both important and they both, as we're going to see, can become sources of anxiety. And then we're going to analyze it, if we can, put it under the microscope and see what God's word says about living successfully um, above it. Now, as we're going to see, anxiety is related to fear. Anxiety doesn't just come out of outer space. It doesn't just uh, suddenly turn up one day. Fear is the body's response to a real or a perceived threat, and it's the fear that generates what you and I <clears throat> think of as anxiety. Now, think about what, what I just said. Regardless of whether the threat is real or simply imagined or perceived, the result is the same the fear will still produce anxiety. For example, I mentioned, I think it was a couple of months ago, I was downtown. Strange experience. Somebody was walking real close to me, and I was kind of uncomfortable. I don't know if you're like me in this regard. I don't like somebody invading your personal space that you don't know. Total stranger, and it's a real person, and it was kind of walking pretty close. So I just kind of picked up the pace a little bit and kept on going. As I got what I thought was pretty far ahead, I can still feel this presence. And then I look on the, the walls <clears throat> coming uh, up as I'm, as I'm walking, and, you know, I see this person's shadow, and I'm thinking, wow, I thought I was well ahead of him by now. He's still dogging my steps. This is getting a little awkward, and I wondered just how long is this guy going to kind of try to stay in pace with me? And then I finally got to a crossroads, and I was debating whether to cross the street this way or go straight or what. And I looked, and I realized there's nobody behind me anymore. But I did notice it was my own shadow <laughs> that had been following me. Uh, try to get away from your own shadow. It's kind of difficult. Now think about it. The initial fear of a stranger getting too close for comfort developed into anxiety, right? But at that point, the threat was no longer real. He was no longer there. But the anxiety remained because it was a perceived threat still to my mind. The shadow I saw, I thought, was still his, and it wasn't. It turned out to be mine, but the result was the same. I didn't feel great. I felt a little bit <clears throat> ill at ease. <clears throat> so there's an, ex an example of how a real threat 
or a perceived threat still generates fear and the fear will still produce anxiety. As I mentioned, my uh, what I would call bomb-proof uh, bomb horse brother Bill uh, was just that, bomb-proof, but he, he was bothered by one thing. If you were out in the trail or on a road or a street or whatever during sunset and he could see his shadow, he would get a little itsy gitsy. He didn't spook, but you could tell he was concerned. And why? Was it, it wasn't a real threat, was it? I mean, he was a 1,000, 1,100 pound animal and uh, pretty bold, and yet he was afraid and he was anxious until he got off the trail. The first example of humans having fear, which resulted in anxiety, was the Garden of Eden. Now think about this. Maybe you have it. I never really put it together until I was studying for this tonight. The threat to our first parents in the Garden of Eden was not perceived. It was not imagined. It was real. I've never really thought this through until recently. Yahweh said, of every tree in the garden, freely eat. It was a command to enjoy everything he'd put there. But not the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of that tree, dying, you shall die, is the way it reads. So in other words, had they taken of that fruit, they would die immediately, spiritually, be separated from God. Eventually, in Adam's case, I think he was 930 years old, they would die physically. And if they didn't change their relationship between <clears throat> the, the tree and the um, their physical death, they would die a third time, eternally separated, body, soul, and spirit, from the presence of God. So the threat of punishment there, the perceived threat, was real. It wasn't imagined. Um, sadly, on the other side of that coin, even something good can be a source of fear leading to anxiety. I could tell you story after story after story of people of all ages that I've known over the years, some from other countries, who were missing out on the greatest blessing of their lives, this side of eternity, apart from salvation, namely the baptism in the Holy Spirit, because they'd been sold a bill of goods and were made afraid of it. They feared the experience of being baptized by Jesus and the Holy Ghost. They feared being filled with the Holy Spirit. They especially feared being given the ability to speak in a language they had never learned. I think about the disciples on the storm-tossed sea. They saw Jesus coming, walking on the water. I wrote an article for a magazine many, many years ago. I was privileged to have it published. And I described in there, and they actually used a picture that depicted it when they put the article in there. I, I talked about what the picture really is. It was almost like the parting of the Red Sea. When Moses raised his rod, the sea divided, and they walked across on dry land. The only difference was, in this case, the water was on either side of the Lord, and he was walking not on dry land, but on water that was flat like a pavement. Can you imagine what that must have looked like to the rest of the disciples in that boat? You would think they would have said, hallelujah, we're not on our own after all. He didn't leave us in the lurch and just continue praying on that mountaintop. He came right out where we needed him, but they didn't. They cried out thinking it was a ghost. Now, how did he get over that? He got over their fear and their anxiety caused by the fear with words. He came up to that boat and he said, Tarsite, which means cheer up. Can you imagine them saying easy for you to say? And then he said, Ego imi. I, I am, mi foviste. I, I am, he identified himself with Yahweh in the flesh. They had heard him do that before. And he said, Stop fearing. Then they welcomed him into the boat, and all that anxiety and all that fear just dissipated. What a, what a beautiful thing. Same thing happened to John the beloved on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation, he saw Christ, which should have been a blessing, just like seeing Christ on a storm-tossed sea should have been a blessing, but he didn't see it as a blessing. He was so afraid he fell on his face like he was dead. But the scripture says, once again, we'll see this how this fits in a couple of minutes, the scripture says there, he not only spoke to John, he said, uh, uh, he said, 
a goat imi, I, I am, he says to, to John, first of all, he said, me for vous, stop fearing. And the Bible said he laid his hand, the right one, on John and said, me for vous, stop fearing, ego imi, I, I am, o protos que o esotos. I'm the, the first and the last. And then he said, que o on, and I am the living one. Now, John had read that phrase and those phrases from a little boy in his Greek Old Testament. So he was then, just like the disciples in the sea, glad rather than sad or afraid. Why? Words that were spoken, just like on the sea, words that were spoken, and in this case, a touch. This ought to get us thinking in the right direction, right? What do you and I need when fear, real or perceived, generates anxiety, we need comfort. We need someone to either say something to dispel that, or we need someone to perhaps physically touch us to break the hold of the anxiety caused by the real or perceived threat which, threat which generated fear. Now, here it is in Paul's life. Look at this illustration, it's beautiful. He, I think, the, I think the more you walk with God, the farther we, we get along with the Lord in, in our walk with him, I think the simpler we become, the more open we become. At least I hope so. There shouldn't be any kind of hidden agendas in our lives. It, we should be the kind of people, what you see is what you get. Someone ought to get around us and think, you know what? That guy puts his pants on one leg at a time just like I do. He lives in the real world just like me. He's... He's no stranger to anxiety or fear. And this is the way Paul is. So he writes to this church, For indeed, 2 Corinthians 7, 5 and 6, For indeed we, we, he adds another pronoun there for emphasis, it means, for indeed we, we having come into Macedonia, northern Greece, our flesh has not had any rest, but rather in each and everything being continually oppressed. I don't know about you, I'm really glad that Paul gave permission to his psychiatrist, the Lord Jesus, to share his notes with us. I remember years ago, I was counseling a young, young woman, and she was being seen by a, a secular counselor, and I was really curious what the secular counselor was thinking, and the secular counselor was, think, was curious about what I was saying, and so she had to write a permission slip for us to exchange information. I could tell her what I had shared and what the girl had shared with me as pastor. She could t tell me what the girl had shared with her as a counselor, and it all worked out. I'm glad Paul gave the, the master psychiatrist the permission to share his experience with the body of Christ because, as someone has put it, suffering is not something to be endured. It's something to be understood. And I don't know whether Paul was aware of it or not, but over 2,000 years ago, as he went through his fear and anxiety situation, his solution would be bearing fruit two millennia later. He's probably still getting rewards because of a preacher in the Queen City talking about his confession here in 2 Corinthians. Isn't that awesome? How many would like to be Paul? Can you imagine what the royalties must be on his letters? We talk about best-selling authors, and there are some, but wow, compared to the Bible, compared to Paul, man, he must have it made in the shade with pink lemonade. Now, when he says we, I want to suggest he's using what writers would call the editorial we. Uh, people in England and people in Australia often still talk this way. Can you pass us the sugar? Can you give us the uh, bread? Obviously, there's only one of them, but you understand what I'm talking about. And I, I think most scholars would agree. He's talking not about him and his fellow apostles, but he's talking about himself. And notice, notice where the problem is. I love this. Flesh. In my flesh. It's not the inner man. Your inner man, my inner man, never has a problem with fear, real or perceived, or anxiety. Your inner man, my inner man, literally does not get anxious or fearful. We never will. Because our inner man is Christ in us, the hope of glory. 
love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faith, and self-control. That's what the real you is. That's what the real I am. It's not this. So he's speaking of his flesh, not the inner man. And he says it's oppressed. That's a verb from the, word, the noun thlipsis. Thlipsis means to be in a tight place, to be in a squeeze. I've used the example of flying coach compared to business or first class. When you fly coach, you're often, <laughs> you're often in a tight spot. And this is the, where, where Paul was uh, um, in terms of his flesh. Here's the battlefield. He narrows it down. Without, no verbs here, without colon strivings. So out here, he's got difficulties going on. Within, peace, right? No. Within, in my body, fears. How many believe one fear would be enough? I, I don't know about you. I'm not into fear. One is too much for me. He's got fears, plural. Look at these two words with me. This first one, strivings, is mahe. What's mahe, Pastor? It has to do with a, a fight. Uh, in Ephesians 6, Paul, the same apostle, uses the word maheron. Take the, receive salvation as your helmet and the spirit as your maheron, sword. Sword. What do you do with a sword? You fight, right? And so maheron comes from mahe, which means striving or literally fighting. Uh, with, with or without a weapon. So we're talking about a tough time. Where did it come from? Who knows? Could be persecution of men, unbelieving Jews and pagans that didn't want to hear the gospel. It could have been with spiritual forces that were stirring up people in situations to cause Paul a problem. What is it in your life or mine? Unless the Lord shows us or unless we're, it's obviously uh, visible, we don't know. But it's trouble in the natural realm. And the second word, I don't think we, might, we need much help with, fears. Plural, fovi. Uh, phobos is, is a, a fear. And we got our English word uh, phobia from that. That Greek letter looks like a B. We, call, we say beta. It's pronounced vita. But the idea is a phobos, a fear, or a phobia is a fear of something that we ought not to have fear of in a perfect world but sometimes we still do. Uh, I had a fear that was unnecessary when I was walking downtown after whoever that guy was had gone in a different direction. It was a real fear, but it was only per per perceived because it wasn't actually there. It was actually just, just a uh, shadow, my own shadow. How sad is that? About as sad as being afraid of the Lord who can deliver you from a storm-tossed night at sea. About as as uh, sad as being in the presence of the glorified Christ and being so afraid you fall at your feet and try to cover yourself. The very blessing becomes a burden, uh, and it's not supposed to be that way. So how many want to move along here and analyze this, this anxiety that he was dealing with? Again, the order is first fear of some kind, then anxiety, and we mentioned, I think, when we were talking about depression a little while ago, that anxiety basically means a divided mind. Uh, you've probably heard someone say, boy, you need to get it together. Have you ever heard that? If you're, if you're belly aching or whinging, you know, that, whatever it is, maybe it's anxiety or fear. You've you got to get a hold of yourself. I like this one. Be strong. Be strong. You might as well ask a monkey to lead the band. None of us can be strong, especially not on command. It's crazy. You and I trying to be strong, it, it's like trying to push the ocean back with a large broom. It, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, you may remember, we used the illustration of Mary and Martha. They're both sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his word. Martha decides, you know what, this is a good idea. Uh, I've got to cut short the lesson, and I'll get started on dinner. And she got so overwhelmed, she asked, actually asked the, the, the teacher to stop doing what God called him to do and tell her sister to help out with the cooking. And what did Jesus say? I'll get right on that. Matter of fact, I'll ask a few other of these uh, idiots in front of me to, to get involved. No, he said, Martha, Martha, you're, you're anxious 
and troubling yourself about many things. Only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the part, the good one, and I won't take it from her. Martha's mind was in two, two or three different places. Um, now, how does, it, how does it work? We say fear generates anxiety. How does it work? A number of different ways. Number one, it can come from outside. Paul said outside were fighting, strivings of different kinds. Uh, for you, for me, could be a doctor's report. You want, what's it going to be? You know, uh, I had a doctor's appointment in May, did a lot of different tests, and boy, I, I tell you what, I wasn't excited about looking at my chart because I didn't know what I was going to see. And then he talked about the echocardiograms, you know, nothing concerning. Wow. But at first, I had a perceived threat, <laughs> not another problem, not more meds or another procedure. So it could be a doctor's report, could be a bank balance. Whoops, you know, nip is racing duck. <laughs> my outgo is greater than my income. What shall be the outcome? My upkeep will become my downfall. Not a, not a cool thing. It could be a job reversal. You get a phone call. You look at the caller ID and it's your boss. Whoops. You know, you haven't even heard what he said yet. You've already got yourself fired, living in a refrigerator box under a, under a bridge, and he's calling to tell you you got the raise. This is real life, isn't it? This is where you and I live. Um, spousal infidelity. How many shows have you seen where the one partner sees their partner with another guy or another girl, and you find out down the road it was their cousin or their brother or sister, and this the spouse has gotten all worked up, you know, and she's already got the, the house stuff divided, and she's, you know, uh, going to have to find another man, all that. It hadn't even happened yet, and it wasn't real. Um, it can also come from inside. That's where I live. How about you? That's what, what really gets me. It can come from inside. I'll never forget. Longest day I live, I had a dream uh, many, many years ago when I was riding my old horse, Bill, and I was in a burning house. And I thought, how in the world am I going to get out of this? I, all I could see was smoke and timbers falling and, and uh, raging flames. And out of nowhere comes my horse, Bill. And he just came right up alongside me. And I jumped up on him. I didn't have a halter. I didn't have a lead line. I had no saddle, nothing. I just jumped up on him bareback, and I, I could still see that black mane. He was a bay-colored horse, that black mane. I just leaned forward, held onto that mane, and boom, he actually took off at a canter, and boom, knocked the doors down of that barn or whatever it was. And I got out, and we were out, in, it was nighttime, we got out in the grass, and I was able to kind of pull him up and Stopped a little bit, and I just hugged his neck, and I thought, thanks for saving my life. When I woke up, where do you think my blood pressure was? <sighs> Wasn't like it is now. Thank God for the way it is now. I take it sometimes just for laughs, you know. <laughs> you know, after it used to be not so good, and now it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, I got out of that burning barn, and guess what? I woke up. It was just like it happened, but it wasn't real. It was not real. Now think about this, beloved. I hope this helps you like it helps me. Fearful thoughts can generate anxiety in our bodies. Again, we say to ourselves, what if the test results are worse than last time? Or we're fixing to go to see the doctor. And my blood pressure generally reads higher when I go to the doctor's office. And it was either Solomon or Barb asked my doctor, my heart doctor, can, that, can nerves really cause that? And he said, well, of course, there can be the anticipation. You know, he's calm as anything because he's the one doing the exam. What does he care? But, but the person that's getting equipment put on him, you know. But the idea is it's a perceived threat, a perceived problem. It's not even real. Now, this probably begs the question, if you're like me at all, uh, or like I would say the average ham and egger, if the anxiety is related to fear, which comes from something registering on our senses, on our flesh, how in the world can thoughts generate it? When our thoughts are in here, how, how, how does that work? Stop thinking about green apples. What did you just see in your mind's eye? How does it work? It works because we see in pictures. And that goes back to the beginning of the beginning. 
If you look in caves that cavemen have dwelt in, what do you find there? Pictures, the oldest language, hieroglyphics, right? Pictures, we think in pictures. And so just like a dream that's not actually happening, it's not real, it's their thoughts, it's, it's inside, not outside. And it's not something registering on our senses because there we are in the bed. I'm not in a burning house or a burning barn. But the thought can generate the same thing because we think in pictures. So how do we deal with anxiety in such a way that we master it rather than it masters us so we can enjoy a better quality of life? Listen to what Paul said. Here's the, here's the answer. But God, even though fighting's without, fear is within, but God, the one continually encouraging the brought low ones. It's almost like a nickname he gave himself and others that are suffering from fear and anxiety. But God, who continually encourages the brought low ones, encouraged us by means of the arrival of Titus, his fellow apostle. This word brought low ones translates tapinus which means humble, it can mean lowly, it can mean undistinguished, it can mean somebody poor, it can refer to someone downcast or even subservient. I found this really sad. In ancient Greek, the tapinos person was considered groveling. What a picture, groveling, slavish, you know, afraid to move left, right, front, or center. Uh, and according to some Greek standards, even mean-spirited. Now, how do we know which it means here? The context, of course, which would be downcast. When we talked about depression, we mentioned this verse, Proverbs 12, 25. Heaviness in the heart of a man makes it stoop. That word heaviness is anxiety. Fear in the heart of a man makes it stoop, makes it depressed. Proverbs 12, 25. So the antidote is being encouraged. And in Paul's case, it came from a fellow apostle showing up, and if you read other scriptures related to this, saying some words about how Paul's letter to the Corinthian church had been received well. They had adjusted themselves. They had dealt with a make-believer in their midst. He had apparently gotten saved, according to Paul. And everything had turned around. So it was, it was comfort and encouragement an anxious or a fearful person does not need condemnation. They need comfort. And this word, parakalon, comes from two words, para, alongside, and kaleo, I call. So someone that is called to your side and gives you a good word or perhaps physically embraces you. Uh, Proverbs also says a good word gladdens the depressed heart. Um, I, I mentioned this before, but I mention it again. When I do weddings, I, I remind the couple, a sorrow shared is halved. A joy shared is doubled. And that's what should be one of the benefits of being married, that you, your sorrows are cut in half because you've got someone to, to go through it with you. Your joys are doubled because you've got someone to share it with. Um, and as I mentioned, sometimes a physical hug can actually help, a physical touch. In the book of Revelation, when, when John is afraid and on his face before the glorified Christ, Jesus didn't just speak to him and encourage him, but he laid his hand on him. How many of you have ever helped a baby by hugging the baby? You ever see a baby and a parent or a grandparent? They're worse, I, I understand. They, and they let's talk to the little baby, you know, and, and stroke the little baby. And, and they tell us that babies that don't get enough of that physical affection actually start off behind the eight ball as they grow up in life. Um, I was separated from my mom, as my sister was, uh, soon after childbirth because of, of postpartum psychosis. And, of course, other people took care of us and so on. But that can set a person up for more anxiety than someone that wasn't taken from their uh, birth mother for a month at the beginning. So that's kind of important. Sometimes it's a physical touch. It, it's words, but encouraging words. Again, not so, well, what kind of a Christian are you now? Straighten up and fly right or pull yourself together. You know, don't sing songs to a, to a uh, 
heavy heart, the, the Proverbs say. Uh, so soothing, encouraging words, or sometimes no words at all, just a hug or a pat on the back or holding somebody's hand. When we were in a near fatal auto crash, it turned out that the only person I could think of that could take us home was my karate instructor at that time. He drove across town, picked us up, made sure we were okay, got us in his car. He lived just up the street from us. Uh, Dojo was farther away, but he lived just up the street. And all the way home, all the way home, I noticed, I felt something. I looked down, and he didn't say a word. He just reached over while he was driving and put his hand on my hand. He just held my hand the whole way home with Barb and Solomon and my mom in the car. That car was hit so hard, it, it spun more than 360 degrees. We all walked away from it with no lasting damage at all. Uh, but Master Kim didn't do anything by way of speech, really. He just put his hand on my hand, and that was enough to really get me through things. So encouraging words and perhaps a, a soothing touch. And then one last thing I'll just add, because Paul does. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul talks there again about anxiety, which again is generated by fear of some kind, real or imagined. And he says, stop being anxious about even one thing, but in everything by the prayer and the supplication with thanksgivings, be letting your requests be being made known unto God. And the peace of God, the one that passes all understanding, will guard your thoughts and heart through Christ Jesus. And he follows it with verse 8. Whatsoever things are good, you know, uh, pleasing, etc., all of these positive things, think on these things. And, and I close with something the Lord told me many, many years ago. I actually wrote a book because of it. I was in the uh, senior, not, it wasn't even the senior center, it was the, it was the next one, the White Oak Center. I was in my makeshift shift office there, and praying about a bunch of stuff and probably behind in payments or whatever as usual. And I'm praying, talking to God about it. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, if you don't like what you see, start seeing what you like. And I thought that was profound. What he was saying is, I gave, I gave you an imagination for a reason. You can imagine yourself going off a cliff. You can imagine them locking the doors on this place because you can't afford the rent. You can, you can see yourself failing in ministry. Uh, and you, how's that going to make you feel? What will your quality of life be? I thought, I already know what that is. Not cool. Or you can see your bills paid. You can see yourself succeeding. You can see yourself finishing your walk with God. Uh, we see this all throughout the Bible. Uh, David said, the, the, Lord, the name of the Lord is a what? High tower. Is, is Yahweh really a big stone edifice on some mountain? Of course not. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Is Yahweh really tending sheep? Of course not. But he used something that he could relate to. Did that magically turn Yahweh into a building or into a sheep herder? Of course not. Did it make David feel better? Yes, because our mind, created by God as it was, does not know the difference between a real or an imagined experience. They've proven that. Our subconscious mind does not have the ability to distinguish between a real or an imagined experience just like me having all the physical symptoms of escaping a burning barn when I haven't even left my bed. So I think that's something else we can do besides encouraging ourselves with words or having someone else, besides maybe having a physical touch. We can uh, master our minds in the sense of we can, we can choose the thoughts and the pictures that come into our mind rather than just accept what's coming from our subconscious that may have been put there as a little child. We didn't know the difference between what it was right or wrong. And uh, it puts, under God, it puts us more in control of ourselves than, uh, than our flesh. Anybody have any questions about this tonight? Or is, I hope it's helped somebody. Anyone questions, input, output, or no? Praise God. I encourage you to, to, to read these verses yourself. 
and kind of, um, you know, again, imagine Paul. Imagine what he was through. Imagine how he felt when Tito showed up and gave him the good news. Think about how you feel when someone tells you they won the lottery and you're a close friend or something like that. It's, it will uplift you, right? And um, we can't control the fear and the anxiety generated by our physical senses, but we can, we can control what we allow it to do. Amen. We're going to come around the Lord's table.